reading the three papers really got me thinking about how very difficult it will be to properly and effectively regulate in this area. Uh, as it happens, I've been thinking a lot about regulation in tech, but not IAI, but really the, the besides do antitrust stuff and all the problems, the social problems called by these, caused by huge tech firms and tech platforms, antitrust can't really solve or isn't intended to solve a lot of those problems. So we've been talking more and more about regulation, open interfaces, mandatory disclosure, you know, all sorts of things. And so I've already been thinking about how hard regulation is in this area and generally in, a, in any context with rapid technological change. And so, so that is certainly one takeaway. I mean, maybe it's not so positive a takeaway, but I think the papers help us think about how can we do that, different ways of trying to do that, where we can do this more effectively or not, okay? Again, the still context before I get to the specific papers. Um, picking up on what you said earlier, AI as a general technology, inevitably then I think regulating it is not going to be some specific sector specific problem. It's going to have to be cut across a lot of regulatory functions, different agencies, or perhaps be some general rule of law related to reliability or something. Okay, so it's going to cut across things and we should be thinking that way. And it, as we, the other thing I think is important to bear in mind as researchers is, and I remember from being here two years ago, we, we looked at what are the analogs about major general, general technology adoption that we can learn to try to predict this and what's difficult to predict. I think the same is true in the regulatory. So let's look at other technologies that have come about, how they've been regulated, what the mechanisms have been, and have they been effective or not. And we have our usual approaches as economists. Is it health and safety regulation? Is it other social goals? Is it externalities? Is it imperfect information? You know, the categories where we think call for regulation. So I think we should all be thinking about, well, if it's health and safety, well, we've got the FDA, right? And we know there's this basic trade-off between you know, having a tighter regulation to protect the public, but you're going to slow things down. Okay, that's all, that's running throughout all of this. That's a very fundamental trade-off. AI is certainly going to be subject to that. I, some, I got me thinking, uh, actually watching the, uh, the Tesla and the Uber examples with autonomous vehicles, how an accident or a problem could be so salient and really throw things off, right? That people say, wait a minute, you can't introduce that technology, it's dangerous. Back in the 30s, you may, may know the story about Buckminster Fuller and his Dymaxion car, which was supposedly a really cool car with three wheels and all this cool, but it had a crash very early on in the first models. Apparently not the car's fault, who knows, it was the driver's fault, but that was it for that car. So, so there's, there's kind of adoption and, and uh, you know, how fast do you want to go. All right. Um, all right. So the other thing then when we think about this generalized need for technology, and this comes up in, in uh, particularly your paper, John, is, is how do we have the regulatory capabilities to do this, okay? So one way to think about it is how can the government, whatever part of it, regulate something that they don't understand? Okay, the technology's moving quickly. You know, one thing is you can say, just stop, don't do any of this till I, if I'm the government until I fully get this. Okay, that could slow things down a lot. Another is, oh, well, I'll keep an eye on you but I don't really have a clue, so it's not going to be a very effective oversight. Okay, so that's a fundamentally a hard problem. Okay, let me turn to the specific papers a little bit with, with um, actually going uh, first with, with the paper we just heard on biased programmers, which I have the least to say about. Um, I think it's a very nice implementation, very carefully done, uh, you know, well worth seeing how they did, did this, great data set to work on it. As an economist, I think, uh, so skipping past the results, which I don't quibble with at all, and I think are interesting, this whole point about the better data, you know, whether you have a full, truly representative sample or not, I think is interesting. There's a couple of things, they, terms they use in the paper that caught my attention and I think will interest you. So you talked about having a data set of convenience, okay, which is, which is often the case, right, in a business. Here's the business, here are the people we, who are employees, or something that we run into in the business, whether it's our customers, our employees, you know, something that, where we get the data. Um, and which I thought, okay, I, we work with those a lot. We kind of recognize it may not be perfect. And then you use another term for that, digital exhaust, which I guess is just what comes out of the system. That was a little painful, I think, for us economists, okay? But it's true. Um, and I guess I found myself just throwing out a question because I don't know the statistics of this nearly as well as you, which is since we, we actually want to pr do predictions for a certain subsample, let's say the people who are applying for jobs, um, and I understand having the broader sample helps. Um, 
what can we learn about, make, we don't, if we screw up predictions for people who never apply for jobs, it doesn't matter as much. So um, anyway, I thought there was a very interesting point about the data and what we could do then to get, get better data or whatever, as well as the other things you said. I will say, another, as an economist, the, the whole assumption, fair enough in the paper, is that, the, that in, in the setup, is that the, the programmers are trying to do their very best to do prediction you know, for a particular thing. You give them a task. Of course, we have incentive issues in practice, where the, you know, there may be um, people who actually want to bias the results because, for, for whatever the reasons, either monetary or ideological or political or whatever, and how do we, how do we see if they're doing that? Again, in other words, an additional level of oversight when we really talk about regulation. Um, if the incentives aren't right, uh, what can we do to, in what cases, to see whether, whether how well can we tech, check to see whether algorithms biased with whatever would, information would be available to a regulator or the government? Beyond the scope of the paper, but just uh, relevant, I think. Uh, let me then flip to the first paper you heard on the, the surveys of the managers. Um, I think this was... Uh, it's real the nice different treatments again just to remind you you know they're look, asking people how would you as a manager allocate resources or adopt AI depending on different um, regulatory contexts that you're reminded of the nature of the survey is those are kind of generalized clue, uh, prompts if you will about if you're concerned about liability or disclosure or something so uh, I think it's most interesting directionally mostly confirming what, with, I think, what we would have expected in terms of how people respond to these uh, regulatory overlays. I like the treatments in that there's different sectors. You know, you've got health, transport, and retail. Um, uh, and, and it's tied to particular things that have been proposed in terms of legislation or regulation. So let me just ad address a couple of those. Um, actually, before I do that, there is a general note here that they think that the smaller firms um, there will be more of an impact on AI adoption if they have these regulations than on the larger firms. And that's a generalized thing I think we've we got to worry about. Regulation may tend to cause fixed costs, incur fixed costs on firms to comply. And that, of course, is going to be you know, more of a problem for the smaller firms. This is certainly a concern when we think about competition issues, entry barrier issues. Okay? Um, I've heard tell, maybe Hal Varian can speak to this later, that GDPR has been great for the big firms because they know how to comply. It's not that big a deal but much harder for small firms and startups to comply. So, got to be aware of that. Um, um, the, um, so so one of the, uh, one of the uh, treatments reflects the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which I hadn't known about. I guess it was introduced in, in uh, the House earlier this year. Of course, it's not law because we can't have regulations in the United States. Um, but. Um, uh, so this, but this whole category of applying to larger firms, mandatory self-assessment of AI systems, disclosure of usage, develop, uh, disclosure of the usage of AI, how it was developed, uh, how it's designed, how people are training, what data was gathered and used. Okay, so a, whole a fairly robust disclosure. That's a whole category of regulation that I think you know, is well worth exploring. How far can that get us? It's pretty light touch, right? It's, it's not saying you have to do this or that. You just have to disclose what you're doing sort of transparent, transparency. And I think economists, we tend to like disclosure and, and transparency. Uh, uh, it may not be enough. Um, I find myself wondering, in practice, you know, how well does that work? How could it work? Like, these things are really complicated. What would actually be disclosed? What would be considered AI? For, what would be subject to the disclosure? AI is going to be built into, if we think of it being built into all these different products, functions, processes, what would be the scope here? Um, so, um, you know, AI is, as a medical, and they have some other examples then in the sectors where the FDA, I guess, has some proposal about how AI is essentially like a medical device or treat it like a medical device. Okay, that's well defined in that sector. Um, have NHTSA and the uh, level four and five autonomous vehicles. Uh, so each of those, you know, I think disclosure you know, you, you can go beyond disclosure to rules, and that's a whole set of rules about you can't introduce a product with these features until we approve it, right? Sort of a prior approval, more FDA-like. Um, how does that work? Um, they, they have the FTC regulating the retail sector. I happen to know more about the FTC than the FDA, so they're not doing that much. Um, okay. Um, but I think the, um, uh, you know, there's a basic challenge what would be the equivalent of the FDA drug trials or medical equipment? So if you think about that category of regulation, 
what would it mean to say you cannot introduce either products or processes until it's approved? Who would do that? What would it mean? What, what would be the scope? And it's very hard. As a generalized technology, it's really hard to say, right? If you could, it's built into so many things. Um, so that, of course, would be the more, let's say, aggressive type of regulation in that it would be, they said prohibits, it's a ban, right? You can't, it's pre-approval, it's a ban, I guess that I would say. But how would that, how would that work? Um, then that naturally leads to, oh, let's this kind of regulatory sandbox idea, which, which I think maybe, is, I don't know, a couple of the papers mention, which sounds good. I used to like playing the sandboxes. Um, but then it got me thinking, well, how's that going to work either? It sounds good to have, like, you know, right, it's in confined, so if something really goes wrong in the sandbox, right, it's going to be, it's going to be limited. But I think there's the following issue comes up, which is it, for AI to work well, a lot of times you need a lot of scale and data. I mean, it's a question about what the scale is, but just follow me with what. If you need a lot of scale and a lot of users, certainly for autonomous vehicles, there are so many different variations, but you need a, you need a ton of, of, re, of use cases. Okay. So you need scale to work well. Now, the government, um, you can't get scale until the government lets you do it on scale, okay? But they won't let you do it until it works well. So how do you get out of that box, okay? Uh, I'm not sure, and no doubt it will vary from one case to another, um, but uh, it seems like a challenge, okay? All right, um, all right. Let me then move on. How am I doing on time? You know, like three minutes, oh, plenty of time, okay. So um, to the paper about regulatory markets, um, this is very interesting, very, you can learn a lot about regulation here and different modes to it. The, the general, the, the, their label for what they're trying to do, we're talking about, are called global regulatory markets, which is really impressive because in their label they've managed to put three dirty words together, <laughs> okay, at least, at least by some of today's politics, right? So look, what you're basically talking about is, is enabling these private regulators from whom the firms would purchase regulatory services and they'd be licensed by the government, this intermediate layer, right? So, um, you know, if you want to think about it from the point of view of the government, they're hiring bounty hunters to find out the people who are breaking the law. If you want to hire, view it from the point of view of the targeted firms, they're, hire, they're, 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 they're choosing among firms who are competing to certify that what you're doing is okay. What could go wrong? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with this structure, okay? Um, well, it turns out a lot. Um, that's the least of it. Um, so I thought of, well, where can this sort of thing work or not? In California, we have uh, pretty strict air control, uh, pollution control, at least until the Trump administration stops us from doing that. And um, so we have smog detection centers, right? Every time your car needs, every few years, you need to bring in your car. And these private garages certify them, okay? Seems to work pretty well because there's a very well-defined thing. You put it in the machine, you test it, it passes or it doesn't pass it. The DMV is not doing that. And I'm very happy the DMV is not doing that because they have really long lines. Okay, so that's good, okay, because it's very well defined. I imagine there are some stations that cheat, but I think it'd be hard to cheat and get people to know about it without having, you know, it, so it seems to work. Compare that to, uh, let's say, the credit rating agencies, which is one of their examples. Complete disaster, okay. As you say, lack of oversight, they, 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 they were paid by the people who were, they were giving approvals to, conflict of interest, no oversight. Uh, they managed to get the crazy First Amendment liability, so they'd be issuing all these opinions that wouldn't be subject to liability, capture, the whole nine yards, okay? So, got to be careful. I think capture and corruption are really big deals here. Um, uh, so, uh, so, actually, unfortunately, most of your examples are pretty discouraging. They've got the example of the credit rating agencies, which is admittedly a disaster, I think. They got the FAA Boeing example, which is also a failure. Okay, now it's true, it was Boeing internal organization supposed to watch themselves, so you're not suggesting that, you're starting these independent, but it's still, the fundamental problem is lack of oversight by the government regulator because the technology is complicated, they don't understand things, and the industry takes over, okay? And uh, medical device safety, another example, is viewed as interesting but not yet too soon to say uh, what's, what's, what the result is. Um, I will say from when I was at the, on the CEA, we had a, this is early in the Obama, well, first Obama term, 
there was a lot of concern in the industry about the FDA's medical device regulation just slowing things down. They were just really too slow. They probably got the decisions right in the end, but it just took too damn long to get these devices out. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a great uh, a success story either. Okay. All right, to summarize then, uh, I think this model or any model, you really have to think ultimately about what is the government entity that is doing the oversight. They need capabilities. Look, the, the beautiful thing about this model is you can potentially bring in a lot more resources. Like if the DMV had all these smogs check stations, it would probably be a disaster, right? Who knows? So you can bring in a lot more resources, potentially innovation. But competition among private regulators, I don't know that I like that type of competition. Okay, that seems to me it could be a race to the bottom in all sorts of ways. So I'm a big competition person, but you know, not necessarily in that area for regulatory approvals. Okay, so I think this is uh, to put, the to then finish off, look, regulation, it's kind of an annoyance, right? The, the, the computer scientists are doing their cool stuff. I happen to, my significant other is a computer scientist. She says, we're doing all this cool stuff. Now you economists, you want to come along and do the economics of it. Okay, well, you're kind of on top of that. That's fine, you can do that. And then we got the regulators on top of that. It's kind of like, they're annoying from the point of the, what, what, but, but, we, but if, you if we ignore it, or if the technologists ignore it, it's at our, all of our joint peril, okay? Because particularly in today's environment, uh, you know, there really will be a backlash. So we fundamentally have this problem, how fast do we want to go? If we slow down technological adoption, the, there's kind of a framing, I don't necessarily say your paper does this, but think, oh, well, that's a bad thing. You don't want to slow down, it's so cool, we don't want the regulators to slow it down. Well, maybe we do want regulators to slow it down, okay? That, well, we don't get thalidomide, right? So I just, so there's a, there's a social, political choice about that, and then there's a question about how to implement it. These papers help us move forward on that question. Thanks.